Hey Yo from the Kingdom of Ohio. You are listening to the Old Culture Podcast, where we will always shoot our shot. And of course, I'm talking about Bigfoot, because that's what this episode is about, sort of. Anyway, I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Our guest this time around is Phil Hall, the author of, among other titles, a book called The Weirdest Movie Ever Made, the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot film. Phil himself is a film writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the New York Daily News, and Wired, and he is the host of the podcast, The Online Movie Show, with Phil Hall, which is available on SoundCloud. And what Phil has done in this book is look at the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot film from a technical filmmaking standpoint, and also as a cinematic and cultural artifact. He also looks at the men who made the film and the details of their story before, during, and after their infamous Bigfoot footage became, well, for lack of a better term, a meme. For the purpose of this discussion, we're not too interested in the quote-unquote authenticity of the film, because whether the footage is real or a hoax doesn't really matter because this is a piece of art whose impact can be felt beyond belief systems. And at the end of the day, you know, this is just a film, just a movie. And as Phil says, it's perhaps the weirdest movie ever made. Phil Hall is in the house, your house, right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. Phil Hall, welcome to the show, man. Really excited to have you here. Looking forward to the chat. Well, Ryan, thank you very much for having me on your program. Not a problem, man. The pleasure is all mine, believe me. So, you know, I love talking to people about films. And we're going to talk about a rather unique film here in a minute that you've written about recently. But before we do, you know, I got to know, because you've written about film for the New York Times, the New York Daily News, Wired, host your own film podcast, The Online Movie Show with Phil Hall, which is available on SoundCloud. You've written three books about film, too. But I gotta know when the interest began, because I know my own interest goes back many years to my childhood. Just loved going to the movies and having that experience. But when did you first become interested in film as a moviegoer, not necessarily maybe as a critic? Well, I need to correct you. I've actually written seven books about film, and number eight is in the works right now. So I stand uh, not, corrected then. Sorry about that. Not to brag. Uh, <laughs> the earliest I can remember watching a film, being intrigued by it, uh, I was four years old. And I was in a hotel room with my family on vacation in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And there was a Three Stooges film on called Cactus Makes Perfect. And there was a gag in the film where a cactus suddenly comes to life and, and wraps its arms around Larry. And I was, as a four-year-old, I was like, whoa, what's, what is this? This is kind of weird. I always loved watching movies, but then everybody does. But I never really got interested into the actual art of creating films until I was around 10 years old. And the, uh, the Beatles animated film Yellow Submarine was on television. And I saw it for the first time. And up to then, I only knew animated films for Bugs Bunny or Walt Disney or Woody Woodpecker. And then all of a sudden there's this weird psychedelic movie with pop art animation and, and Beatles music. And it's like, I didn't know that could be done as a 10 year old. This was 1974. So back then we were a little less sophisticated as kids. And then I started reading up on how animated films were created and then read up about how regular films were created and started reading about film history. And I got hooked on that. I started writing about movies for my college newspaper. I went to Pace University in White Plains, New York. And that was actually done as a bit of a cheat because I was supposed to do an article for the newspaper to interview an administrator at the school. 
and the administrator was elusive, and I wasn't able to get the article completed. And I went to the editor and explained what the problem was. And then for whatever reason, I had said, you know, I just saw a film that opened called My Favorite Year with Peter O'Toole. Can I write a movie review about that and maybe use that instead of the uh, article with the administrator? And the editor said, sure. And that review was published. And then I started writing reviews for my college newspaper. And from there, it sort of took off. I started freelancing for the New York Daily News when I was in college and started writing for other publications, including Wired Magazine, which I wrote for for about five years. And uh, that's sort of where the story uh, takes off from. So would you consider yourself more of a film critic or like, are you more into the, like you said, you mentioned the, the art of filmmaking and like maybe the technique behind it. Are you more of a technician or a critic or both? I would say both. I mean, I, I did film reviews for many, many years. I I actually was on the governing committee of the Online Film Critics Society for a number of years. Uh, my reviews were on Rotten Tomatoes. But uh, over the past several years, I've sort of moved away from reviewing films, particularly the new films that are out. Uh, I've had more interest in film history. I consider myself uh, being a film journalist and a film historian. I've done interviews with filmmakers and, and film actors and whatnot. Uh, so I don't want to just pigeonhole myself into being a critic because anyone can be a critic. I mean, all you need is an opinion. You know, I guess let's then talk about the book because you put this book out last year, about a year ago now, actually, uh, in October, the weirdest movie ever made, the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot film. And, you know, man, I'll tell you what. I've never talked to anybody about Bigfoot on this show. I've never really been into cryptozoology myself in any way never really found it that interesting. So I don't know why I asked you here. I saw the book online and I was like, okay, you know, the weirdest movie ever made. Like maybe this guy has a different view of this film and like maybe the Bigfoot phenomenon than I've picked up from other people. And I think this conversation we're about to have is going to show that, yeah, you, you look at this film like it is a film. It's not this sort of uh, underground conspiracy theory type of thing, like this artifact of like this other world that nobody has any idea exists out there. Like you look at it, I think is more of a, an artistic cultural artifact. And I really enjoy that approach to it. So that's how we're going to talk about it. And of course we'll talk about what's in the film too. And maybe get into some of that as well. But you know, early in the book, Phil, you actually, you compare the film, the Patterson Gimlin film, to the Zapruder film from the JFK assassination. You also call it a celluloid Rorschach test. And those are some provocative, you know, comparisons there. But I'm curious, like, when you first saw the film, like, on your own, you know, whether it was for researching this book or if it was just on your own, you know, out of curiosity, which I'm sure it was, what was your initial impression of it? What did you think you were watching? Well, I first saw the film at a time when most Americans saw the film, which was the late 1970s. I saw it on TV. I believe it was on a show called In Search Of, which was hosted by Leonard Nimoy. And it was uh, all about cryptozoology and UFOs and weird phenomena. This, this was popular in the 1970s. And if your listeners were not around then, they really missed a great time because there was this huge interest in funky stuff like uh, UFOs and Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot and uh, the Bermuda Triangle and all sorts of conspiracy theories and mysteries. And I saw the film, and as a kid in the 1970s, it's like, whoa, this is great. There are, there are real monsters out there. I mean, monsters aren't just something you, you see in the movies. They're, they're really someplace out there, and, and at least one guy, or in this case two guys, got to see it in the flesh. And I never really lost that enthusiasm for Bigfoot from then because that was part of my childhood. People actually paid to go to the movie theaters to see documentaries about Bigfoot and, and other supposed monsters that were lurking about the planet. And we all thought it was particularly normal. And I actually, the funny thing is, I wasn't going to write this book. I had proposed another book to my publisher, Bear Manor Media. And I said to the publisher, I have an idea for a book. It's called 100 Movies That Changed the World. And it would be uh, essays about 100 films that had a very significant impact on culture, on sociology, on politics. And my editor said, that is a terrible idea. Just pick one film, not 100. And I looked through the list and I realized, you know, most of the 
films that I uh, had on the list had already been written about to death. We didn't really need another book on Citizen Kane or Gone with the Wind or Star Wars. But there really weren't that many cinema books about the Patterson-Gimlin film, which is that uh, 59 seconds of grainy, shaky footage with Bigfoot walking through the forest in California. That's where most people know Bigfoot from. And I proposed that not as a Bigfoot conspiracy book, but looking at this 59 seconds of footage from a cinematic perspective. And that's where the book came from. When you saw that film then, whether it was in the 70s or, you know, subsequent visits, I guess, you know, I guess, what did you think you were watching then? Did you think that you were watching a man in a suit? Did you think you were watching a monstrous creature that exists that nobody has any, you know, sort of knowledge of? I mean, we're not talking about this from a cinematic perspective right now. I'm just curious, like, what you think you're watching when you watch this 59 seconds of footage here. Well, it's a bit of a cop-out answer, but I don't know what I'm watching. And that's the beauty of it. Because as a teenager in the 70s, I wanted to believe there was this big hairy monster running around California. As time went by, I realized that, uh, well, maybe there aren't big hairy monsters in California, but still, there's a lot that's going on that isn't easily explained away. When I look at it today... I can be skeptical. I can afford to be skeptical about it because in the research that I unearthed, there are a lot of red flags that went up about the creation of this film, which would lead one to believe that this was not exactly on the up and up. But at the same time, it, it seems sort of sour to just dismiss it as a hoax because I, I quoted Dame Jane Goodall, the, the great anthropologist in the book, and she had said that she wanted to believe that there is something out there, and there had been legends among the Native Americans of the, the Northwest and California of this type of a creature out there. And wouldn't it be nice if indeed there was something out there that is still eluding our detection after all these years? Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the two guys who made the film, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin, you know, you do have some biographical information about them in the book. How did they meet and come together to make this the weirdest movie ever made, as you call it? Well, they were both from Yakima, Washington. Uh, they were both military veterans. To be charitable, you could describe them as misfits. Roger Patterson went through a whole series of jobs. Uh, they both were rodeo riders at one time. Uh, Patterson wanted to be an inventor, and that didn't really take off. Uh, he was obsessed with the legends of the Sasquatch that had been passed down over the years from the Native Americans. And he actually self-published a book on the subject. Bob Gimlin was a rancher, and he was sort of more along for the ride. He wasn't really that obsessed with the subject. But uh, Patterson's enthusiasm was so great that when Patterson got word that there was a, an alleged sighting of the Sasquatch down in California... He convinced Gimlin to come with him, and the two of them drove down from Washington State to Northern California to go into the six, uh, there's a forest in uh, Northern California, uh, to go looking for this creature. And uh, as luck would have it, on October 20, 1967, uh, they supposedly stumbled upon it with a 16 millimeter camera that captured the footage. Yeah, and you said that footage was 59 seconds in length, and I'm just curious, you know, from your your technical background, like how would you describe the footage they shot from that technical standpoint? I mean, obviously they were amateurs, but did they exhibit any filmmaking prowess or skill whatsoever? No, they, they were complete amateurs and it was absurd because they went out with the hope of actually creating a documentary on the Sasquatch and they only had 59 seconds because they had used up most of the film on the, the reel they had loaded doing establishing shots, uh, tracking back and forth across the uh, the forests, uh, looking at the foliage. Uh, Gimlin filmed Patterson on his horse riding back and forth across the stream. The footage itself was shot by Roger Patterson, and according to them, he was on his horse when they first realized that Bigfoot was there. And the horse reared up, and Patterson was trying to steady himself while holding the camera. So the first part of the footage is all very shaky. And it's not until Patterson actually dismounted and is able to focus the camera that we see Bigfoot clearly, or sort of clearly. And it, it's a great distance away. And I think in many ways that's the beauty of it, because if it had been a professionally looking 
piece of film, a lot of folks would have been very skeptical at what they were looking at. But here, this is something almost like the, like I said, the Sapruta film. It was a little bit out of focus. It wasn't framed properly. And yet they're seeing something that you weren't supposed to see. And I think that's really why so many people today are still hypnotized by the Patterson-Gimlin film, because it doesn't look like a professionally shot video. It looks like uh, somebody stumbling around with their camera to film something that uh, is completely out of the ordinary. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, you said it was Patterson shooting the film, right? Yes, Roger Patterson yeah. shot the film. And so isn't he, like, when they see this creature from a distance, doesn't he start running toward it? Yes. He tries to run towards it, but the creature is already in the distance and is walking off. So, And then he's, he stops and is able to uh, get a somewhat clear picture. And that very famous shot where Bigfoot turns around with its arms uh, swung out, that has been analyzed more than any other film except for John F. Kennedy having his head blown off. And because it, it's such a weird, and the word weird keeps coming up because that's the only way to describe it. It's a weird image. This is something that doesn't look right, that has never been seen before, that could possibly be a hoax. And yet it's there before your eyes. And it would seem to confirm all of the legends that had been going on for years and years among the Native Americans of these large, hairy humanoids living in the woods. Phil, I don't know about you, but does it seem odd that he would start running towards that? I mean, you have no idea what you're actually running toward, and if it's a creature that large. I've just always found that to be weird, that like his first instinct is not to cautiously approach it from a distance, you know, like you would like if you're hunting, maybe. What do you make of that decision to, to run towards it with the camera? I mean, in a way, it's kind of an artistic, directorial, cinematic choice, right? It is, but at the same time, the creature was walking away, so it wasn't charging at them. And that's a weird thing. Again, I'm sorry I keep using the word weird, but there's no other real good word to describe it. Patterson and Gimlin said they were not aware that the creature was present until their horses detected it. And the creature didn't seem to be hostile. In fact, it seemed rather indifferent to them and was sort of annoyed that uh, it was interrupted. Supposedly it was uh, drinking from the creek and just uh, started to walk away from them and really wanted nothing to do with them. <laughs> The legends of the Sasquatch, the, uh, the creature is not a hostile creature. In fact, the weird thing is, is that it's mostly nocturnal. And Patterson would later say that he assumed that uh, this was either an elderly creature or possibly a blind creature. Otherwise, it, they wouldn't have been able to see it in broad daylight. But then that leads to the question, well, if it's a nocturnal creature, why did they go all the way down to California to film something that never comes out during the day? Well, how would you describe the the creature looking in this film? And did it have any resemblance to any other sort of stories or legends or sightings that were reported in that area previously? Well, it's funny because the creature sort of looks like, honestly, it looks like a person in a gorilla suit. But there are a couple of things that are wrong with it. For starters, it had floppy breasts. And a lot of people said, oh, well, they just rented a, guy, a gorilla suit and put some guy in it and had him run around like it would be an Abbott and Costello movie. But if they were going to be putting somebody in a gorilla costume, why would they have floppy breasts on it? Because, I mean, 10 out of 10 gorilla suits that you would rent from a theatrical company would be for male gorillas. And they, they wouldn't have noticeable mammaries swinging about uh, the front of the costume. Also, the arms were extraordinarily long and almost out of shape. And that's one of the things that many Bigfoot enthusiasts point to is the fact it's not really a symmetrical creature. The arms are at a very, very extended length. You could even call it big arm instead of Bigfoot, really, because it, it looks that way. And the leg muscles on the creature, you could actually see in the footage when it's uh, blown up, that this is an unusually uh, thick-muscled, legged creature. If it was a gorilla costume, they wouldn't have that kind of uh, strong calf muscles that you have on uh, Bigfoot in the Patterson Gimlin film. Yeah, and there was another sighting in British Columbia in 1955, also in October, actually. And uh, this was at Micah Mountain. And this guy, William Rowe, a construction worker, claimed to have encountered a female Sasquatch while on a hunting trip. And he signed an affidavit two years later. I guess somebody wanted to make sure that he was telling the truth about this encounter. 
And critics of, or I guess maybe proponents of the costume theory say that if there was a costume, that it might have been modeled after this encounter that Roe had, right? That is correct. And that's also one of the red flags that went up with the Patterson-Gimlin film, because Roger Patterson was aware of William Rowe's sighting. So we have, you'd be asking, why is there a floppy-breasted Sasquatch? Well, that's because William Rowe saw a floppy-breasted Sasquatch, though I think Rowe's uh, Sasquatch had more of a grayish tint to its fur than the creature that was in the Patterson-Gimlin film. Yeah, and in the film, you know, Patterson is kind of like, I guess later he comes out of that film as the person who you, is more associated with it. He kind of becomes more famous than Gimlin does from it. And Gimlin's not actually seen in the film as we know it, but I guess there was more like a deleted scene of him, right? Where yes. there was footage of him, but now it's lost, maybe? There was. There was uh, follow-up footage after the creature disappeared where they created uh, plaster casts of its feet, and that's the only time Gimlin is actually on camera, but I believe that footage is lost. Do we have any idea, like, where that may have wound up? Was it just... <laughs> if you could speculate, I guess? Well, I don't think people were that... I don't think... Well, first of all, I don't think Patterson was that interested in promoting Gimlin because there was a very serious rift between the two of them when they started promoting the film. At first, they both did interviews together, but then Patterson created a documentary, uh, which he took around the country to show the footage, and he sort of cut Gimlin out of the profits. Gimlin wasn't part of the promotion, and there was a very uh, serious rupture between the two that was only resolved when Roger Patterson had passed away, and they were able to make amends before Patterson's death. Yeah, I think we might talk a little bit more about their relationship later, but I want to get back to, you know, kind of getting into the analysis of, of the actual film here. You said in the book that there are some elements of the encounter between Patterson and Gimlin and this mysterious creature that are actually absent from the film. What would some of those elements be that we did not see that you think are worth pointing out here? Well, the obvious thing was the, uh, the creature's aroma, which wouldn't be on the film because it wasn't shot in Centivision or Aroma Rama. That's how they were sort of aware that something funny was going on because it had a very, very pronounced odor, not a pleasant one. So we had that. By the time the creature had disappeared into the woods, they had, they, they had lost it. Patterson would re regret not killing the creature, which is interesting because he said years later, uh, because so many people assumed that this was a hoax, that the only way they could have proved it was real would, would have been if they took out a rifle and shot it. But Patterson felt that there was some sort of humanity to it. He felt it would have been wrong just to uh, kill it as a specimen, which is why he did not bring back uh, any evidence, physical evidence of its existence, except for the movie footage. Yeah. And you also said from a production standpoint in this film that there are several hiccups. And you pointed out three specific ones that I'd like to just talk about for a moment. The first one, they only took one camera on this trip. <laughs> Why would they only take one camera? Because they were amateurs. And, and in a way, it sort of promotes the idea that it wasn't a hoax because these guys, would, if they were trying to pull a hoax, they wouldn't have just relied on a single camera. So they didn't even have a still camera with them. One would imagine that uh, one had the movie camera, one would have the still camera, but they were just so clueless as to what they were doing that they stumbled upon, or they said they stumbled upon this creature in the woods. Uh, if this was a professional production endeavor, they obviously would have had better cameras. They would have had sound cameras. This is a silent film. So they, they really were rank amateurs. There's no nice way around it. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure if I, if I went out and tried to do this same thing, you know, uh, film a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or whatever, I'm not really sure I would be that prepared. You know, like, I'm not sure I would think of, okay, I need a sound camera, I need a still camera, I need all this other shit. I think I would just want a rifle, a camera, and some water, and I'm good. But, you know, that's just me. So you actually mentioned the second part, you know, that why wasn't there a still camera ready for that sort of evidence? And then the third uh, qualm here that you have from a production standpoint is that why did they only leave a minute's worth of film in their camera? Why did they only come away with 59 seconds? Again, because they didn't know what they were doing. And that's, that sort of supports the notion that it wasn't a hoax, because if they were going to pull a hoax, they wouldn't just have 59 seconds of grainy, shaky footage, which probably half of it was really worthless. It's just the second half of the film where you get a clear view of what Bigfoot looked like. 
So uh, it's part of the charm, too, that these guys thought, oh, let's go out and make a movie without any clue of how to make a movie. And the funny thing is that the camera they were using didn't belong to them. Uh, Patterson had leased it from a camera shop in Washington State and neglected to turn it back when the lease was up. In fact, he wound up being arrested when he came home because uh, it was considered stolen property. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty interesting uh, <laughs> wrinkle to the story. I was actually not aware of that until I read your book, so it's a neat little detail. That I don't know if it speaks to the character of Roger Patterson, but it might you know, give us some clues as to what kind of guy that we're dealing with here. But, you know, there's other things, too, that just don't quite compute about this. And it's more of this stuff that also happens... Not with the film itself, but after the film has been shot. And I think the first question is that, you know, where was this film processed? Because there's an interesting story about how this film was processed. Because there's a lot of details here that I can't even regurgitate right now, but hopefully you can. So tell us, like, this anecdote from the story, because this is, again, sort of as fascinating as the footage itself. Well, this is where the story starts to run into some problems. If you believe Patterson and Gimlin... They emerged from the forest. They went to the the nearest town, and they sent the film by airmail back to Patterson's brother-in-law in in Yakima, Washington, to be processed. Several problems with that story would be, one, would be the timeline from getting out of the forest, driving to the town, getting to the post office to have it all packed and mailed, The second problem would have been the airmail itself, because that wasn't common in 1967. And if they were sending something out, even at at the time the post office closed, which would be probably around five o'clock, it's not likely they would have been able to get it on a plane to get it up to Yakima, Washington for next day delivery. They didn't have FedEx back then. Nobody seems to remember where the film was processed. Patterson would later claim and his brother-in-law would claim that they they couldn't recall where it was. There has been research into what labs were in the area that could have done this and the labs that were in business at the time were not open on a Saturday. The film was shot on a Friday afternoon. So it would have gotten from Northern California to Washington State uh, by Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon in order to be processed. But you also have to realize too why in the world would they trust this supposedly precious film to the post office when they were driving back to Washington State the next day? And the film would not have spoiled on the trip up. That's not how – we're not talking about nitrate film from the 1910s. I mean, this was a 16-millimeter Kodachrome film, so they could have just as easily driven it home and processed it once they got there. Uh, Some people have speculated that the processing was either done on the sly at a laboratory that was not supposed to be open on the weekend, or it was done in a private residence and not done properly because it did come out looking somewhat overexposed, which, which also adds to the charm of the film because it doesn't look like a professionally shot film. It looks like somebody who didn't really know how to use his camera and wound up with uh, footage that was somewhat overexposed. You know, I meant to mention this when you glossed over their background with each other and how they met, but you mentioned that <laughs> you mentioned they had military backgrounds. Why does nobody talk more about that and the connection that, you know, that might have to this story, that those backgrounds and this delves, I think, a little bit into the more conspiratorial side of things. Like, you know, maybe if this was a hoax, for example, and it was eh, some sort of weird government operation to <laughs> flood, you know, culture with bullshit, essentially... Would that be something that that we should look at closer? It's an an interesting theory, but I I don't think it's a a valid one because they were both enlisted men. They were not officers. Patterson was in the Army. Gimlin was in the Navy. Uh, Neither had a particularly distinguished career. They were both enlisted men, but then a lot of guys back in the late 50s were in the military. They didn't stay in touch with the military, as far as I know, after they were discharged. So I don't really see a connection between them and and any Defense Department conspiracy. I don't see it either. It's just whenever I, you know, you mentioned hearing details in a story that present red flags. And, you know, if you're down those conspiratorial rabbit holes, any sort of like military connection is is always sort of, uh, it's, it's intriguing, I guess, to say the least. So, but back to the film then, you know, you were talking about the processing of it and the timeline of it and everything. 
You know, I'm curious about, I guess, how long they were actually gone. Because I didn't know this. They were in Bluff Creek, which is the area that they were filming in, for essentially, like, what, about three weeks? Yeah, they were, they were riding about. They brought horses with them. And they were just uh, going around looking for something which Patterson assumed was there. And it's kind of funny because the, the name Bigfoot was first used some years earlier. There were tracks that were found near a construction site. And a local newspaper dubbed this uh, these, these footprints belonging to Bigfoot because that was the, the, the local legend among the Indians of these large creatures. Uh, those tracks actually turned out to be a hoax. And Patterson, I don't think, was aware of it, or if he was, he wouldn't acknowledge it. So in many ways, it was the ultimate wild goose chase for them to be there, uh, certainly for Patterson to be chasing after that and dragging Gimlin along, who was just, again, he was just along for the ride. He was not as obsessed on the subject as his friend was. But they had been there for yeah, an extended period uh, at great cost to them. Neither of them were was a particularly wealthy person. So it's funny, if, of course, if nothing had happened, we would never be uh, aware of that. But it would have been an extraordinary waste of time, energy, and money on their part if they came home empty-handed. Yeah, that's what I found curious, was that they were just able to spend so much time in this area, but only came away with less than a minute of footage with their with their camera and they were there for three weeks like you would think that they would have been filming and had a lot more film with them if they planned to be gone that long so it's just uh yeah i just find that obviously very curious so something else i didn't know until i read your book is that patterson and i think you mentioned this earlier patterson actually wrote a book himself called do abominable snowmen of america really exist i've never seen this never heard of it until i saw it in your book what's the content in the context of this book exactly? Well, the expression abominable snowman was popularized in the 1950s to describe what we would call the Yeti in the Himalayas, which was the original humanoid that supposedly was just outside of uh, the human territory. The legends of the Sasquatch go back many, many years, and Patterson was aware of them and was obsessed by them. The word Sasquatch had not been popularized at that time, so he referred to the creatures that supposedly existed in North America as being abominable snowmen of North America, for lack of a better word. This book was self-published. He also uh, illustrated it himself. He was actually not a bad artist. What is funny is the original version of the, the book the concept of what the creature looked like was more towards a Neanderthal man. And after the encounter at Bluff Creek, he reissued the book and put in new illustrations closer to what the creature looked like in the film that he shot. The book is still available. If you go onto Amazon, you, you're able to find it. It's still in print. So you mentioned the uh, the name Bigfoot, where that came from. That was the, the Humboldt Times news story. Uh, you said later that was a hoax, right? Or that yes. Was proven to be a hoax, but... I am curious about the sociocultural history of the Bigfoot and legends like it. You know, you just talked about the Yeti there for a minute, but what's the oldest recorded sighting of a creature like this, like either worldwide or in North America? Like, do you remember? Well, as far back as when the the Vikings landed in North America with uh, Leif Erikson, supposedly they saw some sort of hairy beings on the shore throwing rocks at them. Whether or not that was uh, the natives dressed up in furs, I don't know. The historic coverage of that is somewhat vague. When the European missionaries started to uh, come into North America and then the American missionaries moved westward with the expansion, they would speak to the tribes there. And that's when they first learned that uh, these creatures supposedly existed. And in doing the research, apparently there had been, it was not just unique to the Northwest and to California, but it was all through the uh, the North American continent. In, in fact, one of the interesting things about the book I found was there have been sightings of Sasquatch in every state of the U.S. except for Hawaii, which would mean the entire North American continent from uh, Alaska all the way down to Florida. So uh, this is not something which is unique to a certain part of the country. Yeah, that's interesting because you usually hear it associated more with like the Pacific Northwest area, don't you? 
That's correct. But then there there have been uh, things like the skunk ape and other types of uh, Bigfoot type creatures that supposedly lurked about in the South. Yeah, and you also mentioned in the book that one of the first uh, recorded encounters between, I guess, what we would call white men and these types of creatures was actually written by Teddy Roosevelt. Do you remember anything about that? Yes, I do. It was his 1892 book called The Wilderness Hunter, and he actually told a story in the book um, about a North American trapper named Bauman, whose campsite was reportedly trashed by an unknown animal, though the footprint evidence suggested this animal walked on two feet. Uh, Bauman had a partner with him who was uh, killed by an animal that supposedly broke his neck, and Bauman fled from the campsite. Roosevelt didn't offer any opinion one way or the other whether the story was true, though he did recall later on a hunting trip in Washington state that he heard very strange noises outside his campsite in an area that his Indian guide recommended avoiding, and uh, Roosevelt never offered an opinion what those noises could have been, and he just took the guide's advice and decided, okay, I'll stay inside the tent and not go exploring. So I want to go back to the film then, you know, I just wanted to set up some history there. And so we talked about the processing of the film and the controversy there. But there is a newspaper story that comes out the next day, right? It's the first public acknowledgement of this film. It's on October 21st, 1967, the day after the Bluff Creek encounter. Yeah, that's a Saturday morning. The Humboldt Times Standard is the newspaper. It's, it says, you say, the successor to the newspaper that coined the name Bigfoot back in 1958. And it's got this page one above the fold exclusive, the headline, Mrs. Bigfoot is filmed. How the hell, though, did this newspaper get this story so quickly and to the printer so quickly? Well, it's very simple. Uh, Roger Patterson called them. Uh, That was one of the first calls he made when they came out of Bluff Creek. He called the newspaper and let him know that the, the footage had been shot. And this is fascinating that the newspaper would run this article without any evidence that this took place. No photograph was included. The reporter did not see the film because obviously it was not processed. And that was the first time that the world was aware that there was a Sasquatch supposedly running around in California. Whether or not Patterson knew the reporter uh, is not clear. The article actually did not go out with a byline. We can speculate who may have written it. But uh, actually, it might have been somebody named Al Tostado who was a reporter for the newspaper. But again, this is speculation. And it is it is funny, too, because the article basically gave most of the credit to Patterson. They just described Gimlin as being his Indian tracking guide because Bob Gimlin was part Apache Indian. So it got the impression that Roger Patterson was the great white hunter and Gimlin was uh, his faithful Indian companion. Yeah, I don't know if that flies uh, in today's culture, uh, to be honest. And I, I know our journalistic integrity is a bit different. I think it's actually worse. But, you know, describing people by race is, is not how we do things anymore, is it? So, yeah, that's interesting that there was no byline. Do we know anything about this Al Tostado? Or? Yes, Al Tostado, a Sasquatch uh, historian named Christopher Murthy, uh, speculated that Al Tostado was the, the fellow who wrote the article. We don't know very much about him. We don't know... Whether he had an existing relation with Patterson, I assume he did because Patterson called the newspaper and I don't know why any serious journalist would take the story at face value without any evidence. But sure enough, they did. And they also had the headline, Mrs. Bigfoot is filmed because, again, the the creature that was on camera had floppy breasts. So I guess that was the selling point that there was a female Sasquatch out there in the woods and... When you think of Bigfoot today, most people think of it as being a male creature when, uh, in fact, the creature that was in the Patterson Gimlin film is a female. Yeah, definitely. You know, and so I'm trying to just uh, reconstruct the timeline here. So after they they get the film process, they make the call to the newspaper, all that happens within, you know, 24 hours. But in the days and the, the weeks that followed, they actually wind up in Vancouver, British Columbia. Why are they there? What are they up to? They wanted to get the scientific community to approve of what they filmed. And they decided to go to the University of British Columbia in Vancouver because uh, there was more familiarity with the Sasquatch legend 
in British Columbia than there would have been, say, in New York or Washington or at Harvard. So they took the film up there and they arranged for a screening at the university. Several professors and museum scientists were there. Patterson brought the plaster casts of the footprints that they uh, collected from the Bluff Creek site. And the screening was a, was a complete disaster because all of the, the professors and the scientists who watched the film dismissed it as a hoax. And they weren't impressed with the plaster cast and they didn't believe what Patterson and Gimlin said they saw. So to their credit, they were able to get some media interviews set up in Vancouver to spread the word that the film was out there. But there were still no photos or footage shown from the site. The local television station in Yakima, Washington, uh, did broadcast a piece of the footage when they had come back. And that was the first time that the Patterson Gimlin film was on television. But unless you were living in that area and watching the local news, you wouldn't have been aware of it. So they actually got some interest that you write about in the book from Life Magazine. When did that happen and, and how was that relationship or how did that relationship with Life Magazine actually transpire and, and turn out? Well, we're not certain who contacted whom for Life Magazine, but Patterson and Gimlin went out to New York City with the film in the hopes that Life Magazine would publish the stills from the film. Uh, Life Magazine published the Zapruder film after the Kennedy assassination in 1963. At the time, it was the most prominent magazine in the country, and it seemed like the natural place to publish this finding. But the editors out there were a bit skeptical, and they asked to screen the movie for scientists from the American Museum of Natural History and the Bronx Zoo. And the reaction was the same as in Vancouver. It was completely dismissed as a hoax. And the magazine wouldn't touch it. And it seemed like this was uh, would have been the end of the story. But there was another magazine out there, not as prestigious. It was called Argosy. And it was um, through the work of a man named Ivan Sanderson, who was a cryptozoologist, who arranged to have uh, Argosy publish the stills from the Patterson Gimlin film and to talk about what uh, occurred at Bluff Creek. And it's because of Argosy that we know about this today because it was an early 1968, actually the February edition. And they had five screen captures uh, from the, the film with the headline, Exclusive First Photos, California's Abominable Snowman. And underneath the headline, it said Gimlin and Patterson, how we found and photographed it, which was kind of interesting because uh, for the photo shoot they did for the magazine, uh, Bob Gimlin put on an Indian headdress and a wig that made him look like a 19th century warrior instead of somebody hmm. who was a, a 1967 rancher. But uh, nonetheless, Patterson and Gimlin uh, were in front of the public. And this was the first time most people were aware that this thing existed. Yeah, okay, so after the Argosy publication, things get interesting between Patterson and Gimlin. We mentioned sort of the riff that they had at the beginning of the chat here, but, you know, this is when this... There's another film that comes along, and we need to set up and maybe talk about that, too. It's called Bigfoot, America's Abominable Snowman. Turns out this was a pretty successful endeavor for Roger Patterson and his brother-in-law, who you mentioned earlier. Gimlin didn't really see a lot of success from this because it was mostly Patterson pushing this thing forward. But tell us about that film and what it was about and what it actually did for their relationship to each other. Well, that film came about by a total fluke because very few American media outlets were interested in the story. Miraculously, for Patterson and Gimlin, the BBC was interested and they wanted to show the footage on British television. The problem was that the BBC was... Uh, not very well financed at the time. They couldn't afford a licensing fee. So BBC and Patterson came to a deal in which Patterson would supply the film to them. Uh, BBC would make their own short documentary and in turn give that to Patterson for a theatrical presentation in the United States. But with the caveat, it would not be broadcast on American television. So Patterson took the BBC documentary and shot new footage of his own, basically pretending to going around looking for Bigfoot, and presented it in theaters under the title Bigfoot, America's Abominable Snowman. And he self-released the film 
in theaters, initially in the Pacific Northwest and then throughout the Midwest and other parts of the country. And something like this was not very common in the late 1960s and early 70s, where a filmmaker would go on a city-by-city tour, book a theater for a few days, usually a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. When there were no theaters in the town, they would book a a school auditorium or a VFW hall, any place that would be able to show 16-millimeter film, uh, promoted the film in the local media, would be there to give a presentation before and after the film. And this was a major box office hit. And it was completely under the radar. Hollywood wasn't aware this was going on, but uh, Patterson was able to rake in a ton of money, very little of which actually went to Gimlin. For lack of a, a better expression, he cheated his partner out of the profits from this film. Yeah, I think you said in the book that it was the 10th highest grossing film of whatever year it came out. I didn't write the year down, but that's interesting that it's not a Hollywood production, but somehow it it rakes in all this money. Now, there is some dispute, or there has been some dispute over the years about the actual rights to the footage itself, to the patterson Gimlin film. That's an interesting story. We don't have to tell it all here, but where does that stand now? You know, who owns the rights to this footage today? The rights to the film wound up being sort of in limbo because Patterson kept licensing it out to various production companies and television networks to show it. So it it wound up that uh, almost a half dozen people claimed the right to the film. Right now, the film is under copyright to uh, the respective estates of Patterson Gimlin, a man named uh, Rene DeHinden, who was a Canadian who somehow got involved in this project as well. The actual film itself, the 16 millimeter film that they shot, the whereabouts of the film, honestly, I don't know where they are. There's been some question whether or not that has been lost or if it's in a vault someplace. But this film has been bootlegged so many times. And in fact, most of the times, if you probably see it in a documentary on TV, it's probably a bootlegged version. And it's uh, many people assume it's a public domain film, and it's not. There was a copyright at one time that Patterson had control over. Now... Obviously, films like this have inspired, or could have inspired, some other filmmakers. So when do we start to see the Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot influence on both the big and the small screen? Is there a timeline here that we can associate with the influence of this film? Yes, there is. The first time we see something relating to uh, Bigfoot, actually something called Bigfoot, was an ABC TV series called Here Comes the Brides. It was... On TV in 1969, it was sort of a a Western light drama. And there was an episode called The Legend of Bigfoot, where the uh, the title character was actually a white furry giant, not the, the black furry giant we know from the movie. And the following year, in 1970, there was a movie called Bigfoot. It was created by a producer named Anthony Cardoza. And it's about a lady pilot played by Joy Lansing. She was a well-known actress. This was her last movie who has to parachute out of a malfunctioning airplane. And she lands on the ground and is captured by the Sasquatch who becomes romantically infatuated with her. And this is actually something which turns up in a lot of Bigfoot movies where the Sasquatch is erotically aroused by these beautiful women. (laughs) So uh, there's, that's not part of the Native American legend. That's strictly um, Hollywood. So Bigfoot uh, apparently was out there for a while. Even Roger Ebert got to see it and reviewed it, and he, he was completely dumbfounded at what he sat through. There was a few other films after that, including The Geek, which came out in 1971, which was actually an X-rated Sasquatch film. Again, this time uh, Sasquatch had two women play with, which is kind of funny. Uh, The most famous Bigfoot-inspired film, and I think going back to what you were saying, the 10th most, actually, this was the 10th most popular movie of its year. It was called The Legend of Boggy Creek, and that came out in 1972. And uh, that actually took place down in Arkansas, because as I had mentioned, there were legends of Sasquatch-like creatures through the South. Uh, A lot of them were known as the Skunk Ape. But Legend of Boggy Creek was a low-budget film. It played in drive-ins and grindhouse theaters. It wasn't uh, in a Broadway cinema or any big uh, movie houses. But it uh, grossed $4.8 million in theatrical rentals in 1972, which made it the 10th most popular 
movie of the year. And that was the year that included The Godfather and Cabaret and The Poseidon Adventures. So that's no mean feat. And since then, there have been almost too many Bigfoot films to categorize and uh, inventory because it seems like every year there are at least a half dozen movies with a Bigfoot theme coming out. And once we get into the digital video production era, we have tons and tons of movies coming out with Bigfoot related, both horror films, comedy films, animated films, uh, family films. Uh, there's Little Bigfoot. And of course, Harry and the Hendersons was the most famous of them. That was um, produced by Steven Spielberg. So uh, by this time, Bigfoot has already become such a, a deep part of the pop culture that uh, nobody thinks twice uh, over whether or not such a thing exists. Yeah, and my apologies. You're right. I did have my notes that that was the Legend of Boggy Creek film, not the actual documentary that Patterson had produced. That was the 10th most popular yeah. film that year. So because technology has evolved, obviously, since this film was originally shot, I'm wondering if how to has the analysis of the Patterson Gimlin film evolved? You know, I imagine that it has, but I'm just not quite sure how people might look at it today differently than they looked at it, you know, 40 years ago. Well, they can look at it as a stabilized film because the original film was very shaky because as Patterson claimed, he was jumping off his horse and chasing this thing. But now, thanks to digital technology, the shakiness is stabilized to a point that we can actually see what it would have looked like if this was shot on a tripod and a stationary camera. So in that sense, we're able to uh, get a better idea of just what Bigfoot looked like walking through the woods. Uh, we can analyze it almost down to uh, the nth degree that you could see the hairs on Bigfoot through the digital technology. If you just looked at it through a 16 millimeter projector back in the late 60s and 70s, it, it just it looked very foreign and very exotic. But today we can zoom in to see what Bigfoot's face sort of looked like because it is still a bit blurry. And we can see the muscles and the legs and the shape of the breasts and the arms. Some people claim that you could see that Bigfoot's feet are boots because of the way the sole of the feet look. Some people claim it doesn't look like a creature that's been walking in the woods very long. So that's where contemporary technology has taken the film. It hasn't really answered any questions. Uh, it's actually raised more questions and only further divided people into the camps between those that insist it's the genuine article and those that think it's a fraud. Well, one thing you note in the book is that this film has actually never been critiqued by filmmakers and film scholars. So one of the final chapters in the book actually focuses on that. You have a number of prominent cinema-focused critics, scholars, and creative artists whom you ask to look at this film and offer their views on what they saw. Because as you know, you know, Roger Patterson actually wanted to be a filmmaker. So why not, you know, posthumously welcome him into the profession and set up a peer review? So you, you did just that. And I think that's completely fair and probably necessary, too. And there are several folks in this chapter who you talk to. So in the interest of time, I just want to know, who do you think made the best case? Well, I, I don't. Nobody actually came out and said this is a fraud. People looked at it through very different spectrums. They looked at it through a pop culture spectrum, how it influenced uh, a lot of Hollywood productions in the 70s and beyond, how it became a, an integral part of that era's fascination with cryptozoology. We, prior to that, cryptozoology was really a fringe consideration. And in the 70s, with Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster and other creatures like the Ogopogo and other funky beasts that were supposedly out there, people started to look at science very differently and started to question, well, maybe there is something out there that the zoologists haven't been able to classify. I'm looking at people in the who wrote for this uh, that section of the book. Uh, Jeffrey Peters writes for the News and Times, and he's uh, a PhD from Catholic University. And he's basically looking at it, uh, what are people looking at when they see the film? They're looking... Are they seeing what's on the screen or are they just, is this a reflection of themselves, their own uh, fantasies and prejudices? Some people like Michael Leggi, who is a well-known underground filmmaker, gets a certain nostalgia from considering this. Going back to what I had said uh, earlier is that if you grew up in that era, that was a part of the era. And you can't really denigrate it because you're, you're stomping on your own childhood. That's true. And I think, too, it's just important to keep in mind that 
regardless of whether it's a hoax or whether it's authentic, it's just a film. And a film is a piece of art, and art is open to interpretation. So in some way, I guess it, I don't know, it doesn't really matter to me if it's real or not. I think you're missing the point of the artifact in that case. Would you agree with that or disagree? You know, people ask me about being a film critic and what is that all about? And when you stop and think about it, a film critic, like any other critic, isn't really talking about what's on the screen or what's on the stage or what's on a page or what's on a plate or what's in a picture frame. They're talking about themselves. They're talking about what fascinates them, what repels them, what hypnotizes them, what confuses them. And I think more than any other film, the Patterson-Gimlin film brings that out in people. When you look at this, a lot of people would just say, oh, it's a hoax and you're a dum-dum for believing it. But then other people would say, no, it's not a hoax. This, look at it. This is real. Can't you see what I see? And you're going back and forth and you're not really talking ultimately about this big hairy thing walking about in the California woods. You're talking about what you're seeing and what you're perceiving and what you want to believe. And that's really, in a way, that's why I wanted to have the the film critics and the film scholars come in to get their opinion because it is a work of art in a strange way, maybe a sloppy art, maybe it's sketchy art, but there is something artistic about it. And there's a beauty to the film because it's so brief and you don't get, the creature just doesn't stop and come to the camera and there's no interaction between Patterson and the Sasquatch. It's this fleeting image of something that's, Maybe we shouldn't have seen, but we did see it, or did we see it? And then we're back on the carousel again, debating whether or not this is real or whether this is a hoax. Yeah, and, you know, in a way, it's like the perfect film for the social media era. It is less than a minute long, and it's it's weird, it's creepy, you know, it's perfect for the internet, right? You know, I am curious, though, because I've seen some weird films. I just watched the latest Lars von Trier movie. It's fucking weird as hell. So I'm just curious, like, why did you slap that phrase on this, this book and, and on this film? You know, why is this to you the weirdest movie ever made? Because it's not something that can just be easily dismissed or easily embraced. You look at Bigfoot... And it looks wrong. As, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's not a symmetrically built creature. The arms are too long. It has breasts that flop about. It, it moves in a strange way. It's captured by people who should not have captured it. They're not professional filmmakers. They're not zoologists. It was these, these two ex-rodeo writers from Washington State. And somehow or other, this, this, this obscure ribbon of film found its way into the center of popular culture. And even today, we're still talking about it. You mentioned the YouTube generation. Go on to YouTube, just write Bigfoot into the search bar, and you'll be flabbergasted that there are still videos being created of people debating the authenticity of a film. And this was shot in October 1967, so this is more than a half century ago. It's something that uh, that just doesn't go away, uh, no matter how many times people insist that it's a fake it won't die and there will still be people talking about it and that will spur other people to talk against it and it will just keep going and going i mean i wouldn't be surprised if a hundred years from now somebody comes back to the subject and does their own book and we'll have uh, whoever is doing podcasts in the next century uh, they'll be discussing this topic we can only hope right a last question for you man and this is the most important one, I think. Do you take the shot or not? Well, that's an interesting question. I've never been asked that. I would have to say yes. As cruel it is, because I'm, I'm not a hunter and I've never killed, intentionally killed an animal. But you would have to, because that was Patterson's one big regret, is that he didn't shoot it, because that would have answered the, the question once and for all. A lot of the skeptics insist that, well, if Bigfoot exists, how come we've never seen any fossils? There have been no carcasses of it. If they were able to produce the creature, then that would have uh, basically closed the conversation, and we would have seen, yes, it is. Over the years, there have been people who claim that they have a Bigfoot corpse. It always turns out to be a fake uh, going back to the late 19th century, there was a claim that uh, something was captured. It was called Jocko. People th- thought it was a gorilla, but that turned out to be a hoax. The only way that the debate could truly be settled one way or the other 
is to produce either a living specimen or a dead specimen. Now, if Patterson and Gimlin were professional zoologists, they would have had tranquilizer guns with them, so they wouldn't have to kill the creature. They could have just tranquilized it, tied it up, and brought it back. But uh, they didn't think that way. And uh, in a way, I'm sort of glad that they didn't because it keeps the conversation going and it keeps uh, the whole mystery of Bigfoot alive. And that's the beauty of it because once mysteries are solved, uh, it takes all the fun out of it. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%, man. So, hey, Phil Hall, tell people where they can keep up with you and your work and where they can find the book if they're interested. Well, the book is called The Weirdest Movie Ever Made, the Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot Film. You can find it on the usual suspects' uh, websites, Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, the other e-commerce book sites. My publisher is called Bear Manor Media, and they sell the book from their website as well. As a writer, you can follow me on Cinema Crazed. I have a weekly column there called The Bootleg Files. I do some every now and then occasional original reviews and interviews. I also write for Video Librarian magazine. My next book will be out next year. Uh, it is called Jesus Christ Movie Star, and that is about the history of how the motion picture industry depicted uh, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ from the 1890s, the dawn of the, the motion picture experience, up until today. Yeah, that sounds pretty awesome, man, actually. And, you know, I, uh, I mentioned you had three books earlier because I'd only written three down in my notes. But, yeah, I just looked at your bio again. And, yep, there are seven books there, and I might have to pick up some of these, man, for sure. So, you know, Phil, hey, man, I appreciate your time. Really appreciated the chat and really enjoyed the book, too. And, you know, like I said, I learned a lot about Bigfoot and the story behind this film that I had just not known before. So I would encourage the audience to definitely pick that up if they have any interest in the subject whatsoever. So, Phil, again, you know, thanks for the time and take care of yourself, man. Thank you so much. And also, I have the podcast, as you mentioned, the stop, start of the show, the online movie show with Phil Hall. It's on SoundCloud. Our fourth season begins October 7th. So be on the lookout for it. Awesome, awesome, absolutely. I will link all that in the show notes for sure, man. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ryan. And there you have it. My thanks again to Phil Hall. No Patreon extension here due to time constraints on my end, so my apologies for that. But I do hope you enjoyed the chat regardless and consider supporting the show here in its final days. The final episode is 144, which is creeping on a come up. Just three episodes left. And maybe, maybe an epilogue of sorts as well. We'll see. I'm playing it all by ear, which is actually a good teaser for the next episode in which we welcome back an old friend and we talk all about music. As for this track with Phil, not much to add to it. Never really been into cryptozoology or the Bigfoot stories, but it is obviously a cultural phenomenon judging by the popularity of shows about it on the History Channel and Animal Planet and National Geographic and wherever else you find dank Bigfoot programming. And the key word there might just be programming. Best to keep your wits about you with this kind of stuff after all. But it sure is fun to believe, isn't it? And I think that's why I wanted to talk to Phil about it, because this material was not pursued on his end out of belief, but more out of a sociocultural curiosity and, in a sense, an artistic curiosity, which I appreciate and I hope you do as well. Anyway, my thanks to new patrons Tristan, Rob, Claire, L. And Ross, you can join them in supporting what's left of the show at patreon.com slash culture. And I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. If we can get to, let's say, 500,000 patrons by the time the last episode drops, I'll keep doing this show. So that's only about eh, 499,840 more. So if you want to keep this thing on the airwaves and keep it in your ear holes, do your part and spread the word. And if you do, I'll absolutely hold up my end of the deal. And also, you know, my birthday's coming up, so what better gift to give? Anyway, my time is up for now, so until next time. You've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. <laughs>
Please rewind this cassette.